Good afternoon, everybody. While our next uh, star-studded panel is getting uh, settled into their seats, we have another uh, poll question for you. Um, so go ahead and find your clickers, if you would. Uh, in March 2017, so roughly uh, a year from now, yes. how many U.S. troops will be operating on the ground in Syria? And uh, take note, it's uh, how many do you think will be operating, not how many do you think should be operating. Um, so go ahead and find your clickers. And the results? So clearly an escalation. It's a difficult question. We're asking you to essentially predict the course of the current campaign, which if you're like me, you find a bit unpredictable at times. Um, but we will see, we will see. So um, as I said, a star-studded panel, um, unique in that we're not discussing how we plan or think about the conduct of conflict, but how we uh, resolve conflict, how we end wars. Um, here to help us work through this, uh, as I alluded to, is an exceptionally uh, 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 array of experience and expertise, uh, not just from Syria, but uh, globally. Uh, many of them have been introduced al already before. I'll start uh, on the extreme left, Renia Abuzaid, a award-winning uh, journalist, uh, and also a fellow at New America Now, writing a book on Syria. Janine uh, Giovanni is the Middle East editor at Newsweek. Um, her book was already plugged uh, by Anne Marie, uh, but she's uh, uh, also got an incredible amount of experience in uh, Syria. Nir Rosen, a special advisor with the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, um, been in Syria for about five years now on the ground. Um, and last but not least, uh, Michael Semple, former deputy EU special representative on Afghanistan and also a professor at uh, uh, Queen's University in Belfast, one of your lesser known affiliations given uh, your expertise. And I'd like to start by just asking them to kind of uh, make some, some brief opening remarks on, on something that uh, we maybe take for granted, and that is, and we think about uh, conflict resolution, and we think about political processes to enable peace process. How important is it in how we define the conflict itself. How should we think about how we even frame the conflict before we uh, start? And if I could, uh, we'll just uh, start with you, Renia. With regard to Syria, for example, um, I think that although with time it has increasingly taken on a sectarian hue, the, the root causes are still primarily political rather than sectarian in the sense that um, the majority Sunni rebels, for example, will not hesitate to kill or um, imprison Sunni soldiers who are fighting with the regime, and in the same way, the, uh, the, the regime soldiers will not hesitate to kill or imprison minorities. Um, so I think that you know, we have to be careful in terms of uh, the narrative that we allow ourselves to believe in terms of what's, what's really happening. And of course, with the regard to Syria, it's not just about the Syrians, it's a um, proxy battlefield. And we have uh, foreign fighters on, on all sides. We also have uh, foreign political players on all sides. So it's, um, I think it's important to understand the root causes and the, um, the principal drivers in terms of, uh, b before we can talk about resolution. Janine? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've, I've been reporting war for 25 years, so nearly 20 conflicts. So it's always very tempting for me to try to put uh, war and ending war, conflict resolution, in terms of a template. <clears throat> when I began covering Syria in uh, 2012, but of course I, in my 20 years working in the Middle East, I had been there before, um, I, I started to begin to compare it to Bosnia and the end of the war in Bosnia. Um, now, we know that the Dayton Peace Accords, brokered by Richard Holbrook, ended the war, ended the killing. Um, Twenty years on in Bosnia, there, is still, uh, there are still grave problems, um, mainly that it froze the front lines. It rewarded the, the perpetrators of violence and of war crimes. And in a sense, it really exasperated any kind of ethnic tension. <clears throat> so my initial... Um, my initial feelings of that I, would, I could compare the two wars, I began to see that I, I could not. They were very, very different. Um, I think one of the gravest mistakes, and we'll, we'll go into it in more depth, I hope, um, in terms of the Syrian peace process and the attempts to end the war in Syria, have been the absolute um, lack of people like Nir on the ground 
that could identify the proper stakeholders and analyze them. And this is something that they really failed to do, leaving a, a, a huge disconnect between what's happening today in Geneva, uh, Vienna, um, and also Geneva 1 and Geneva 2, the frameworks with which they're trying to end the war. So there's a real, um, there's a real mistake of diplomats and policymakers not to have enough identification from the ground, clarity from the ground. Um, and it, it, I think it's basically one of the reasons why we've had such a protracted uh, conflict and why we're having such difficulty getting the right people at the table because they haven't even begun to analyze who the characters are that need to talk, need to engage in dialogue, need to open up, um, and, and really to understand them. So I think this is, in my view, one of the gravest errors that's been made so far in the peace process. Nir, Janine uh, suggests that we don't even define the, the structure of the stakeholders and of the conflict itself correctly. Uh, do you agree? Is that part of the problem? Yeah, but we've also, it, there's a total lack of knowledge of what's happening in Syria and in, in Iraq uh, to a lesser extent, but it's still a problem. But even of the phase in which we're in, you, know, you asked me to discuss how will the wars end. I don't think they're going to end in the foreseeable future. I think we're in, in like the beginning of a new age. It's like the end of the Ice Age. If I, and if I could identify the moment, that would be 2003 when the invasion was like the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. It changed the entire ecosystem of the Middle East and. Um, created new identities and destroyed all identities. New species came into existence, including a species called the Sunni Arab, which hadn't existed as an identity really before, but suddenly became one. And uh, the uh, in interventions, whether peace nego negotiations or military interventions, in a way are kind of, uh, to continue this sort of biological metaphor, they're halting a Darwinian process, which may be essential and that it would lead to winners and losers emerging much the way they did in Europe before modern Europe was established. Um, so what we're going to see, however, I think, is an evolution to a new reality, not, not any settlements, not any Dayton type agreements, but a gradual evolution in Syria and Iraq and in Yemen and the, the region that I sort of, sort of work in to a reality of less war but constant instability where there is a strong central government that has authority in the capital, but the farther away you go, the less authority it has. When well, this exists already in Pakistan and Mexico and Nigeria and elsewhere, and that's the future of Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, maybe even Egypt and, and parts of Tunisia, and on and on in the Middle East. So Sykes-Picot won't disappear. The borders will remain the same, but the authority of governments in those borders will be far less, and you'll have areas that will be under control of former insurgents turned collaborators with the uh, central governments uh, considered in Syria, and then areas that will be totally out of control for many years to come until there's a gradual reintegration. And this creature that was created from this uh, sort of American asteroid that hit the Middle East in 2003, is this new thing called Sunnis, who think of themselves as, as Sunnis primarily, um, it's part of a very worrying trend which is going to be with us for a long time because more and more to be Sunni means to be Salafi or to be Wahhabi. And that's a problem that's go, uh, occurring from Mali all the way to Indonesia. Um, and the legacy of, of uh, it started with Iraq, but the legacy of, the, of this, uh, and specifically of the wars in Syria and Iraq, are you going to have millions and millions of displaced people who happen to be Sunni Arab. Their cities are destroyed probably forever. Uh, nobody's going to have the money to restore the Ramadi, Mosul eventually, parts of Aleppo, and on and on. Every, every major Sunni city is almost destroyed. And you're going to have a permanent population, perhaps live, uh, similar to the Palestinian refugee population in Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, not to mention Europe, so longing to return and yet unable to. If I can end on a positive note, though, the one nice thing I see is that the U.S. has at least finally embraced a policy of de-escalation, um, as opposed to, uh, up until quite recently, a policy of uh, more violence. The whole, the whole approach was we're going to use more violence to achieve political change. All that did was worsen the conflicts, introduce foreign actors, whether Russia or Iran. At least now there's a realization that our interventions, whether in Syria and Libya or elsewhere, have made things much, much worse, and we should pursue a way to reduce the conflict as fast as possible. Thanks, Nir. Michael, um, the conflict in Afghanistan, is this uh, an insurgency in the classic sense, or is this a proxy war uh, imposed from externally? Well, the thing about ending it, though, is it's, you know, it's like 
uh, giving up smoking. That you know, they say it's, it's easy to give up smoking. I've done it lots of times. <laughs> and uh, since uh, since 1989, we've ended the war in Afghanistan about six times. It's sort of on average, on average, the war in Afghanistan ends every five years. There and and of course, in the the different processes where it has seemed to end, we tried. Uh, international agreements, national agreements, agreements which were implemented, agreements which you know, you know, fell, you know, fell dead on the first day without being implemented. We've even tried military victory a couple of times. We've had you know, Taliban military victory, US military victory, um, all these things. And of course, what happens is that there's, there are some underlying drivers which have driven the violent conflict to resume quite soon. And yet, each time there is a uh, there's a reconfiguration of the the actors and of the conflict, and that's why this is, I don't give you a straight answer to your question immediately, um, because uh, insurgency and proxy war those are elements which have operated slightly different in the successive uh, phases of the conflict, and you know. Where we are today is, of course, not quite where we hoped we would be today. You know, it's. 2016, we should be celebrating the 15th anniversary of the uh, short military intervention to end a long war. And of course, what we were meant to be celebrating was uh, the, in the wake of that short military intervention, the consolidation of a sort of a, the Afghan equivalent of the liberal order. Um, and you know, we would be celebrating it and having cultural exchanges with them and feeling good. And of course, it didn't happen. And if we want to understand, unpick the elements of insurgency and elements of, of proxy war uh, and try and think about how next time it's going to end, uh, we'd be looking at, OK, what were the factors? And they're good, you know, six or seven factors to be able to unpick. I'm not going to go through the list now because you won't let me, um, uh, as to for, uh, why those factors undid this plan, this idea of having a consolidated order in the wake of a, yeah, a short and very effective uh, military intervention. And I think what if you know, we get into the discussion now and on other days, why it might be relevant to how wars, how wars end, or indeed, as Nir is saying, how they drag on um, uh, elsewhere, it's because of the six or seven factors that you can find which defeated the attempts to stabilize Afghanistan over the past decade and a half, they are likely to be present in many of the other conflict theaters that we look at. And certainly, you know, there's an awful lot of cross-fertilization between conflict in Afghanistan and conflict in Syria. Well, let, let's go back to Syria. And, and the, today's panel is timely. Obviously, next week uh, in Geneva, there's an expectation that talks on Syria will resume. Uh, for our experts there, and, and you can pick a con conflict, because uh, similarly, there's uh, developing news in the other direction that talks, or the, the outlook for talks in, in Afghanistan from, coming from the quadrilateral there are, are not as optimistic given the Taliban's posture. But how, how optimistic should we be about the course of these peace talks, and what could be done to improve that outlook or that uh, prospect? Um, uh, Renia, would you like to start? I mean, ha help us make sense of what we're about to see over the next couple of weeks. I haven't um, <coughs> given much stock to the peace talks, to be honest, because they are um, they exist on a universe which is completely disassociated from what's happening on the ground. Um, the regime is one thing, but when it comes to the various rebel groups, for example, the people who are in Geneva or wherever it might be who claim to speak. Um, for the anti-Assad opposition generally speak for, for themselves, um, completely disconnected from the reality of what's happening on the ground. And the other thing is, is that, of course, the various um, spectrum of anti-Assad groups, they just don't have a fixed address. They don't have um, the one sort of uh, power, the one person, the one uh, organization that can speak 
for all of them and that can influence them. Beyond the fact that they want to see the end of Assad, they differ in terms of what happens next. So, um, you know, that's one thing that doesn't sort of bode well for, uh, for the talks, like who can implement on the ground whatever is decided in, in, in the peace talks. And if we were to talk about the uh, current cessation of hostilities, for example, if you were to point that out and say, well, look, you know, they listened to that. I think that was um, more about battle fatigue and fatigue on the ground than it uh, is about listening to um, you know, people who claim to speak for the political opposition in exile. Janine Nair, do you agree or disagree? See it differently? Yeah, I mean, I, I spent six months following uh, Stefan Di Mistura, the, the current special envoy, um, and around, and he generously gave me time to observe how the peace process was working. And um, while I think, I'll start off by saying I think he's got a disastrous job, Mission Impossible, um, and he has worked very hard. I think all three envoys, first Kofi Annan, um, Brahimi, and, and now uh, Di Mistura have not really, in a sense, grasped what the concept is, nor have they been able to penetrate in any way um, what seems to me uh, any kind of long-term solution. And I think part of it is that, well, they're, ha they're, they're, they're hampered by the fact that they're working with the UN mandate. That's the first thing, and I think that's very difficult. There's people that Di Mistura cannot talk to, um, and I wanted, I was talking to you earlier about how I've just finished a thesis at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy on um, creative diplomacy in terms of Syria. So what lessons can we learn from the past? You know, we, we don't have a Holbrook type figure, a Richard Holbrook figure who was so instrumental in Bosnia because basically he was a bully. He was, he was a bully that got things done. He made Milosevic and Izabegovic sit down together in Dayton, he held proximity talks. He made them, he made them see each other every day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner when they loathed each other. And eventually, he got he got the deal closed at the ninth hour, at the moment when he was about to write um, back to Washington and say, "We we can't do it. The war is going to continue." But there isn't a Holbrook-like character who has that kind of force, or the United States behind him completely. It's, it's in the hands right now of the UN. Um, and I think that there's been a lot of mistakes made, but the biggest one has been, as Rania said, they have not clearly identified the people um, that they should be talking to. That and Geneva 1 and Geneva 2 communiques, which basically set out the terms of the transition, I saw, uh, I heard Di Mistura saying yesterday, we're beginning to discuss this week in Geneva um, how the elections will take place. And the elections, they're still fighting. I mean, there has been this cessation of hostilities, but there still was 135 people killed in the, in the first week alone. So it seems as though there's this delusion, this delusional sense in Geneva or Vienna when they all came out high-fying each other, thinking they had ended the war. What the diplomats see from Europe is not at all what is happening on the ground. And I think until they address that, and that is something that Holbrook grasped, that they don't seem to, um, I think they will never get any further. And we might have as protracted a war as Lebanon. I hope not. But um, it doesn't seem that they're making any progress. And this is the third envoy, dedicated diplomats, um, who have been unable in any way to, to move it forward. Near. I Should we be more opti pessimistic, actually? OK, good. Um, thank you. <laughs> and I, well, my one concern is that having shocked everybody that by adhering to the cessation, for the most part, uh, all the various players, the Russians, re regime, insurgents, uh, et cetera, um, a hasty resumption of political talks may be the worst thing we can do right now, because we might raise the issues that are provocative and result in some elements saying, to hell with this. Um, I'm going to go back to fighting because I'm not going to get what I want. So I would have preferred that people enjoy a period of normalization for a few months before being confronted with the choice of go back to fighting or accept that you might not get what you want. However, uh, what we have seen is that the insurgents have been remarkably coherent in their uh, adherence to the terms. And that uh, also quite a surprise is the fact that the US was able to get them to do that, given that the US has limited influence over the insurgents and limited influence over Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Um, but what perhaps is, it can't be said exactly is that the, 
we are now conforming in part to the Russian diktats. And if the US feels like it's a partner with the Russians, it's a bit more like the kid who's sitting on your lap in a car driving, who thinks he's driving. But the, the terms of the conflict or the resolution have largely been defined by the Russian intervention, which uh, has removed issues of regime change from the table. Um, that was a primary demand of many of the insurgents, of course, and of certainly of Saudi Arabia. So bringing these issues up again so soon may be provocative. However, it also seems like the international players have largely accepted the Russian vision of what's going to happen in Syria. And so perhaps we'll at least see a continued de-escalation. But like I said, no actual settlement or end to the war. Let me, let me change the question a little bit for you, Michael. Janine mentioned that sometimes we're not talking to the right people. Um, how do we think about irreconcilables in a reconciliation process? Um, how do we determine who the right people are to speak with? In the Syria context, we have al-Nusra, which is uh, outside the, you know, the, the, the normal mental construct of kind of a two-dimensional uh, fight. These are multi-dimensional, where you know, the enemy of our enemy is not necessarily our friend. In Afghanistan, the Haqqanis are part of the Taliban, but they've been designated a foreign terrorist organization. So how do we, how do we think about who to talk to and who's, who's reconcilable and irreconcilable? Uh, uh, big challenges, and I'd have thought that uh, the more degrees of freedom that we can provide to the, the people who are tasked with the, the diplomatic work, the better. In other words, um, they, it really sounds like a, a recipe for disaster to take somebody like Stefan de Masura and charge them, okay, here are the ones you can talk to, here are the ones you can't talk to, please get the, uh, get the solution. Because, uh, yeah. If you want to stop the fighting, ultimately you have to get a, a critical mass uh, of the uh, the fighters have got to be on board with um, your settlement. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, fictitious. It's going to be like you know we've had several of those settlements previously in Afghanistan. I mean you know they're signed and they're never implemented or they fall apart um, quickly. The I actually hear it from uh, some of the Taliban who I've had the privilege to talk to, uh, almost turned upside down. Uh, that it's yeah it, it's well-known in sort of political practice that quite often movements use the, the process of negotiations of trying to, uh, to boost their cohesiveness. The greatest um, uh, sort of proponent of this, or at least the, the, the practicer of this, who I'm aware with, was Muhammad Ali Jinnah who in the uh, negotiations, which ultimately led to um, partition of British India and the founding of, of Pakistan, just, yeah, he set himself up as you know, told the, the sole spokesman. Um, you're going to talk with Muslims, you're going to talk with me. Um, nobody else has the has a right uh, to uh, to represent him, and he managed to leverage the um, the the run up to to partition to consolidate his hold, build the Muslim League, and ultimately make Pakistan a a, a reality. And when you find a situation like Afghanistan, where we're, where we're in that. The, you know, the, the current leadership of the, of the Taliban, no, they're going for military victory. They see a relatively weak and dysfunctional government, which is you know, what's left of uh, what we hoped for the, of the Afghan liberal, uh, liberal order. Um, they are prepared to you know, wait and fight them out. Um, and they have emerged as the, the, um, the, the sole um, interlocutor for the, you know, all our engagement over the, um, the, the past few years. I mean, even in, from the times of your previous, uh, your own previous uh, incarnation, and a lot of the a lot of the people in the movement who have uh, reached different conclusions from the people, those who are you know holding on to the the, the leadership, who uh, believe that a uh, a perpetual conflict doesn't actually count as a victory for us. We can do better than that. Uh, they of course are f they're frozen out. Uh, when your engagement is essentially with a single address. So I think that they, it's important to look for um, creative approaches in the engagement where, um, for, uh, where you go for, where you work out, okay, we know that we have to carry with us, I mean, the main body of fighters, but we also don't want to freeze out of the political process. We have to look for creative ways of bringing them in. Those who might be part of a process of change in the way that they, you know, the actual, the, the fighting organization does business. Creative thought there. 
And then there's a different part of the dilemma, which is around, uh, you know, which is the Afghan equivalent of the, the Syrian problem of uh, those who are never going to sign up to any, any kind uh, of, uh, of deal. And for the sake of argument in you know, Afghanistan, we've got, we've got the Al-Qaeda's, uh, we've, we've got the Daesh's. Um, you, know, you can, you can you know, rest assured, there is a list uh, of those who see the continuation of conflict as a political opportunity because they're like, I mean, the, you know, what used to be the, the Trotskyites in my days at university who always had to have a protest about something so that you could organize and mobilize and build your, and build your ranks. So these people you know, are not going to be uh, about uh, part of some kind of consensus um, solution. Uh, and of course, one has to, un one has to understand them. Uh, and probably one has to, uh, to seek a, one, one needs the discrete interaction with other parts of, you know, again, the armed people on that side, where they have moved from a position of being in, in alliance with the irreconcilables to deciding that their future best interest may actually be disassociated from them, helping to marginalize them, and being part of an emerging pro-peace coalition. Um, so you know, we've got to be, you know, yes, we've got to deal with the hardliners in power. We've got to deal with the, sort of the, um, the, you know, the, you know, the peaceniks who aren't in power but can still be useful. And we've got to understand but ultimately marginalize the uh, irreconcilables. Before we, I'd like to uh, give the audience a chance, uh, and while the microphones are getting ready, um, and going back to where we started, this question of how we see the conflict. I mean, when you look at this group, the one thing that strikes you, uh, it certainly struck me, is the level of expertise you have, not just overall, but in the field, on the ground. Um, these are people who watch the conflicts, see the conflicts firsthand, don't just read about them uh, in capital. So how much of a gulf do you see between how we see these conflicts from capitals through the media versus what you see kind of firsthand on the ground. How wide is that gulf and, and how, how big of a problem is that? Janine? Well, I, I want to, uh, I can address it, but I also want to ask Michael something. Um, do you feel we could get historical lessons from the Good Friday Agreement because, um, you know, as we know, John Major had said, it turns my stomach to think that we will ever speak to killers and murderers. And in terms of, um, and as, as we know, Jonathan Powell and others, Tony Blair, then went on and did talk to the IRA and make agreements with them. And historically, there's always been this repugnance about we can never speak to terrorists, we can't speak to killers. Um, <laughs> governments, if, if people are held hostage, I'm French and American by nationality, I always carry my French passport because I know the French will pay for me if I'm kidnapped, um, whereas the Americans and the Brits will not. So how, how do you draw the line? I mean, at some point, and I've been researching this, um, we, people do talk to Nusra and ISIS perhaps might not be, it might not be ripe yet, it might not be, the ripeness isn't there, the moment to negotiate or at least talk, but what about just opening up dialogue and do you think we can learn from what happened in uh, Stormont um, in those days and how it did eventually lead to the Good Friday Agreement, which as you know, I grew up in England in those times before and, and, and there was, a, it was like living in, um, people, felt that it was a terrorist war. I mean, yeah, I'm almost inclined to ask Jeff, what did you conclude? <laughs> well, I, yeah. I mean, do we talk yeah, to terrorists, as, as uh, Jonathan Powell uh, would put it? But, terrorists who are designated by the State Department or the UN list. But these are the people, these are the very people we need to open dialogue with. So how do we get around that? Well, the, I mean, Secretary Clinton, obviously, when she announced the US policy on reconciliation with the Taliban, uh, tried to soften the blow by saying, well, you have to understand you in conflict, you don't come to the table with your friends, you come to table with your enemies. But in these multidimensional conflicts, it, it clearly is not so simple, right? Um, uh, but let's, uh, if, if, if you, if you want to offer thoughts on the, the kind of the ground perspective versus the, the media perspective as in terms of how we see the conflict, and then let's go to the audience and get some uh, questions. Near, near. I used to be a journalist and my, uh, b before I began this mediation thing. So I worked in Iraq, Afghanistan, elsewhere, and I've never seen a conflict so poorly reported and the reality on the ground. Which, which the, conflict near, this, the Syrian Syria, conflict, okay. rather. I mean, Iraq was very terribly reported. There are issues of the embedded reporters and of lack of access and lack of Arabic experts, or that lack of area experts in general. 
but in Syria even more so because Syria was kind of a, almost a black hole in terms of media and academia before the crisis uh, began. And then there was lack of access issues because the government was issuing visas or because it was too dangerous for most people. Um, and because of the Arab Spring euphoria where uh, there was a sense that there's good guys and bad guys and this beautiful, amazing thing is happening. It's the best thing that ever happened. And freedom is gonna uh, ring throughout the Arab world. Um, and so the complex narrative of Syria certainly never emerged and it was immediately a good versus evil and also a simplistic sectarian narrative where it's an Alawite dictator oppressing a Sunni majority population, um, which w isn't true in Syria. And we'd also simplify the sectarian narrative uh, in, in Iraq. So it, it's been, uh, it's obviously affected policy because most policy is based on information coming from open source, as is most intelligence. And people have no idea what's going on in Syria with the nature of the insurgency, the nature of the militias affiliated with the regime, the regime's intentions, and I see this even when it comes to the Russians. We've had to like go back to our Cold War experts on the Soviet Union to try to understand the Russians. And so we've demonized them and everything they do must be bad because it's the Russians doing it, even if we happen to actually, we can't say it, but be allied quite closely with the Russians uh, and even with the Iranians and Hezbollah in, in, uh, in these conflicts. We have to maintain this good guy, bad guy kind of narrative. Rene, any thoughts before we go to the audience? No, I mean, I agree with uh, a lot of what, um, what Nir said, but uh, just to add to it, if you just, you know, Egypt was always more than Tahrir Square, but the, the people through which the story was told was so small that, um, you know, it was focused on a particular part of the country, which wasn't really representative of what was happening in, in much of uh, the rest of the country. And, you know, it's the same thing across the Middle East, this idea of, um, you know, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And, Good people do bad things and bad people can do good things. And you know, you have to um, um, consider that spectrum and, and uh, the, the world is completely gray and we have to approach it as such in our reporting and in our writing and in our discourse. Well, let's open up uh, this incredible group of expertise to the audience. I'm gonna get thought first. Okay, go ahead and then we'll uh, go to the audience, Michael. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think it was re very relevant, the question you're asking about the, um, the, sort of the, uh, you know, the field knowledge versus what's been thought you know, far away. Uh, because in Afghanistan, uh, my understanding of what's happened is that the you know, one reason that attempts at intervention, particularly from the US, uh, have been sort of thwarted and they've achieved outcomes different from uh, what people anticipated uh, was because uh, the, the many of the actors on the ground in Afghanistan are absolutely superb uh, at, you know, at disinformation, uh, at manipulating relationships. And when people talk about, uh, on a strategic level, but when, they, uh, when people talk about a proxy war, what they, you know, they, they refer to, you know, yeah, like, Evil, you know, evil powers, um, you know, paying their proxies to do things for them. Whereas my understanding, it always works the other way round. It's you know, very clever, well-informed, astute Afghan actors who are thinking, this is what I want to achieve against such a person. They're more powerful than me. You know, who can I enlist unwittingly, preferably, to support me in overcoming my local rival? And yeah, you know, and that's how they dealt with the Soviets, and that's how they, you know, how they played their civil wars. That's how they have duped. Pakistan, and that's how they're gaming the uh, the U.S. and the and what they play upon is indeed um, this you know this asymmetry of information. They're superb, superbly well informed, and we are superbly it. badly informed. Yes, yeah, plays into it. Yeah. Completely. Ending wars is a matter of uh, propaganda wars. So uh, let's go to the audience. Uh, please, if you could, uh, state your affiliation, uh, your name, um, and uh, please use the microphones. Uh, Pete Apps, I'm Global Affairs columnist at uh, Reuters. Uh, I mean, who in government should own this? Because I'm really struck by the fact it's a fan you know, people like Janine really know how these wars work, but there's no counterpart in Whitehall or Washington. I mean, uh, maybe Michael was in Afghanistan, but you know, by and large, you know, if you go to a, a room in a building in Washington, everyone's talking about ISIS. No one has that kind of granular knowledge of Syria or even Afghanistan. So, where in government should own this expertise? By this, you mean the political process of? Who, who, who in government should be the person who actually knows what these groups want, who realizes they're being played by some local warlord in a town they've never heard of? 
Anybody want to take a stab at recommendations to the governments here? Well, uh, that should be the, the role of uh, intelligence and, and State Department, the foreign ministry. However, the fact that they can't do that is further evidence that we shouldn't play these games in the first place, that these interventions lead to secondary and tertiary consequences that are totally out of our imagination and out of our control, as, at least as Western institutions. So don't do it because there's nobody in the government who can do it, especially in democracy where people are rotating constantly. So the advantage of authoritarian states is that at least they have longevity of, uh, of people in charge of these files, and you see that in the way that the Syrians or the Iranians and other states in the Middle East are able to handle these conflicts a bit more long-term in their thinking because it's the same people who are in charge for so long. The West just can't do it. Janine. Um, you know, I was having this discussion with, with um, a group of diplomats a, a few weeks ago, and the days of the old-fashioned British Arabist working for the Foreign Office are, are over, in a sense. And once there was a time when they would have experts and put them in the field, and information gathering was much more robust. And I think now one of the things I've certainly noticed following the, the UN process is that the people involved in the back offices don't have any interest in, in Syria or Afghanistan or Yemen or Libya. They're, they're trying to move their pay grades up and they're, they're, they're locked in their own bureaucracy that there really isn't the kind of desire, I think. And, and that feeds into the whole political will. So, I mean, I think that we've lost the kind of specialization and the, the expertise and a bit of what, if you want to link it to the media in a sense, um, the Arab Spring, was this jubilant time when there was a lot of optimism, but it drew a lot of reporters who had never not only reported conflict before, but the Middle East. And because of what Ronnie was saying about our shrinking business and resources, and freelancers are used more now who are brave and, and will go into Syria or Libya or wherever, um, but they don't have the context of putting it into, into the whole geopolitical uh, scenario. They don't know about the first intifada or the second intifada or what actually happened in Yemen or the background of Saddam. So it's, you know, we live in times because of shrinking resources where we're less reliant on experts and on people who really know what they're doing from the ground. Um, and that's why, you know, I'm very happy to be with this panel because everyone here has really done their time in the field and, um, yeah, I think policymakers should listen to us more. <laughs> But you're not ready to go into government yourself? You're I not? might. Okay. I might be. So you've enlisted one. Uh, any other thoughts? Or okay. Uh, uh, back here, this gentleman uh, with the glasses and the red tie. Uh, thank you. My name is Joseph Schneider. Um, and the question I have, what do you think, you know, we know there's a lot of constraints and a, a lot of bad experiences in, in our attempts and not much success. Uh, so what do you think our objectives should be in these sort of situations? Should we just establish a cordon sanitaire and let everyone just go at it and, uh, and just make sure it doesn't spill over? Or should, you know, or should we have more direct objectives and then find ways to, to actually influence events on the ground? What's the objective? Well, who's Do us, first of all? Yeah. Though, with it? That, that, there's no uh, common objective, not even for the West, the UK, France, Germany, the US all have very different interests, let alone for the many actors uh, in the region who have their own interests when it comes to Syria or Iraq, or likewise, I'm sure, in Afghanistan. Um, we don't have the same objectives. And it's, but it's also, the question seems to imply that we were just minding our own business, sitting at home watching TV, and then, oh my god, this war started in Syria or in Iraq. Uh, but we're deeply implicated, uh, certainly in Iraq, but even in Syria, both because it's a legacy of Iraq, but also because we've thrown plenty of fuel as America on that fire. Um, so it, there's a sense of responsibility and a continued involvement. Um, the objective should be, from a moral point of view and from a security point of view, to reduce conflict, not to escalate conflict. The policy has been, certainly in the, in the last few years, if not the last few decades or centuries, to escalate conflict. Um, by intervention, by removing states, and we, in my experience, short as it, as it is in Iraq, Libya, uh, um, Yemen, Syria, the intervention, whatever the intentions are, however uh, well-intentioned we may be, leads to further conflict. So uh, the primary goal should be on reducing violence, and that both from a humanitarian point of view and from the point of view of protecting uh, Western security interests and preventing refugee flows and all that. Others, Michael? 
when I hear, uh, uh, I think that it is a legitimate and appropriate objective for uh, you know, great powers like the United States to pursue that, to promote peace. Uh, and, they, and of course, there are always going to be other you know, other objectives as you know, as well. Uh, but uh, you know, there are lots of you know, there are, there are lots of positive spin-offs um, uh, from peace, and you know, and we all know that peace is far more than just the absence of uh, of violent conflict. Um, it's a legitimate objective. If you if you build that in as uh, one of your important objectives, you've also you know with you know, as much understanding of what works and what doesn't work, and you know, and Nir is uh, throwing lots of uh, uh, lots of warnings of recent experience of what uh, of what doesn't work. Uh, but also, uh, if you accept peace as an objective, you also have to accept time, the timeline that goes with it, uh, because uh, something which has you know, defeated many international projects over the years is the attempt to get you know, to get things done in completely unrealistic um, uh, timetables, which may have some relevance to you know local political cycles, um, but not to what can be done. So. You know, promote peace and be prepared to, uh, you know, to try for a long time to create the conditions so that eventually you succeed. Okay, let's try to um, get more questions in here, please. Let's go back to the audience. Um, back here in the uh, corner. Hi, Matt, Matt Frankel. Um, getting back to the subject of the topic, how these wars of the future will end, if you accept the premise that Iraq, Syria, Yemen is going to become Libya is going to become more the norm of how small conflicts are fought. In other words, multi parties with conflicting means and external intervention. How do we solve these problems? We've come a long way from the old insurgency template of the U.S. on one side, the Soviets on the other side. We get the two parties to the table and work it out, or one side is near postulated, maybe just fight it out till the stronger side wins. How do we need to change our approach uh, given that these complex, uh, conflicts are now multi party? Thank you. Can you do that briefly, a model for resolving 21st yeah. century conflict? I was, <laughs> again, you know, I'm often drawn back to the, the Bosnia, um, but I don't think in this case, again, I don't think that Syria fits into the, the, the template of Bosnia. I mean, I'm tempted to say, and in hindsight it is absolutely no use, that Syria could have, there, had we had more long-term strategic insight into ending it, it could have been prevented. But I could say the same thing about Bosnia in 1993. You know, there were, there were chances all along where the war could have been ended, halted, um, thousands of lives could have been saved. And 2013 in um, Syria, right after Ghouta and the, the Red Line, might have been an opportunity when the war certainly could have been cut short. Um, but then, as we know, what happened with Cameron and Parliament and then Obama's decision. I think the whole policy of nonchalance has been deadly, and it's had serious repercussions, not just in Syria, but throughout the region, um, in terms of you know, the Russian involvement. Purely from a civilian point of view, since September 30th, since they began their airstrikes, there's been more um, civilian casualties. People tell me that they're more frightened of the Russian airstrikes than, the, than they were before from the Assad um, strikes. So I don't know, actually. I think that a lot of this could, could have been preventive. Um, you know, co examining the conflict early on and seeing what steps could have been taken to shorten it and to um, contain it, perhaps. But I think now um, I have a very gloomy outlook, and I'm not gloomy by nature. Anyone like to have the last word, Rania? Uh, no, I think. Okay. Final closing thought. I mean, if you know, if we look at, if we look at uh, the the failures and the, so the barriers to progress across these new conflicts, that the, the failures are primarily political, and you know, the, so the, yeah, the military piece has been there, but just, yeah, it just hasn't been able to deliver if it's not supported by effective political action. So I think one of the approaches for dealing with these multi-actor, multi um, uncertain, timelined, uh, difficult conflicts is rebalancing our effort between the military and the political, ensuring that any military action, if it is, if it is required, is backed up by effective political action, which is up to the complexity of the environment in which it operates. So that despite the you know the complaints that we had about lack of you know lack of expertise and so on, I mean that you know that we we acquire that and we have 
multiple channels for engaging, multiple addresses that we use, and we get creative in kind of in the, the kind of actions that we can use to you know, drying up the fine. Drying up the finance doesn't just mean bombing facilities. Mm. Um, there are other ways of, uh, of, of drying up of finance. I've always felt that, I mean, the act of getting you know, over 100,000 troops onto the other side of the world and keeping them supplied with water was such you know, beyond human care. When you think of all the challenges involved, it's absolutely massive. So anybody who says what we're talking about are the political challenges of these conflicts, it's nothing compared with supplying you know, water for 100,000 troops on the other side of the world. I mean, let's, you know, let's get serious and do it. So I mean, the military deserves to be complemented by effective political action commensurate with the complexity of the conflict that we're dealing with. Inspirational insights uh, and very wise uh, reflections from a, an experienced group. Uh, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking this great panel.